Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, our next speaker is Adam Van Toyle from McMaster University, and he will tell us about comparing the regularity and the degree of H polynomials. So over to you, Adam. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, let me thank the uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, it's been a great conference so far. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the regularity and the degree of H polynomials. And these will be mostly about ideals that are combinatorially defined. So it, the talk here is really gonna talk about kind of a, a collection of papers that have been kind of looking at the same theme, this topic. And I kind of wanna give you the current state of the art concerning this particular problem. So I'm gonna start, of course, by defining both of the terms and the titles, because maybe not everybody is familiar with both of them. The one that maybe most of you might be familiar with is the idea of an H polynomial. You may have seen it in some context before. So the setup is we have a polynomial ring uh, over a field. We have a homogeneous ideal. And for most of this talk, it will be an ideal that's generated by um, monomials. And the quotient ring R mod I is an N graded ring. All right, so we can break the ring up into graded pieces. And so we have an ice graded piece. And the point is that each ice graded piece is a finite dimensional K vector space. Okay, so we can take all, we have an infinite number of vector spaces, each of finite uh, dimension. And what we can do is we can stick it into a generating function, kind of similar to what we saw in the first talk uh, earlier today. Uh, and we, we get what's called the Hilbert series, right? So the Hilbert series is this generating function where the coefficient of T to the I is simply the dimension of the I's graded piece of the quotient ring. Okay, so we have this generating function, but a famous theorem of Hilbert and Serer says that we can take this generating function when we're dealing with a homogeneous ideal in the polynomial ring, and there's some sort of polynomial with integer coefficients such that you can rewrite this Hilbert series as a rational function where the numerator is given by this polynomial H and the denominator has the form one minus T to the D. Uh, D is the Kroll dimension of the ring. And we have the actual con extra condition, of course, that the uh, uh, when you plug in one into the numerator, you don't get zero, so it's in lowest terms. Okay, so the object at the numerator here is called the Hilbert polynomial. Uh, sometimes you might have seen it you're looking at the age factor where we're looking at the coefficients of this object. But for, for me today, what we're interested in is not just the age polynomial, but the degree of this age polynomial. Okay, so as an example, say I have an ideal, I've written its generators, so it's generated by these like four monomials of degree two. I've written out a first couple of terms of the Hilbert series, and I've asked the computer to crank out what the Hilbert, uh, what the Hilbert series is in a rational function, and the H polynomial is just the numerator, one plus two T minus T squared. So I think this is an object familiar to many of you in doing combinatorics. The, the other object in my title was the regularity. Now, the regularity is really something coming from uh, commutative algebra or algebraic geometry. And there, there's a lot packed onto this slide and I'll, I'll give you a different way of thinking about it in, in a second. But the formal definition is you take your quotient ring and you're making a long exact sequence. And each of these objects in here, even though they look complicated, is really just direct some copies of the polynomial ring, but you're giving it all sorts of different grading. You wanna keep track of like the degrees of the generators of the ideal and the degrees of their relations and so on. Uh, so you, each of these things are just polynomial rings and the beta ij's are called, or are called the graded Betty numbers. And what they're measuring is the number of generators, the kernel in these maps of a particular degree. Now, th there's a lot there, you know, it takes some of my students, you know, you know, a couple of days to figure out this definition. There's a, there's a simpler way to think about what's happening here. It's each of these maps, phi one, phi two, and so on, they're actually uh, matrices, okay? And they're matrices whose entries are polynomials and they're homogeneous polynomials. And what we're doing is we're looking at all these matrices that show up and we're looking at each of the polynomials and we're picking off the largest degree of the polynomial that shows up in there. And that's another way of defining what's the regularity. The formal definition of the regularity is you're looking at all these beta i j's and you're looking at the difference between j minus i and you take the max. But maybe for you, uh, if you haven't seen this before, is there's a bunch of matrices with entries that are polynomials and we're picking the largest degree that shows up. Okay. The regularity is important in commutative algebra and algebraic geometry because it somehow measures the complexity of your quotient ring. Okay, uh, here's an, the same ideal 
I've cranked out the resolution here and the graded Betty numbers are beta one, two uh, is four. So that's corresponding to this one. Beta two, three it's this as four is this number and beta three, four is the one is this number. Again, what we're really interested in is the difference between these numbers two, one, three, two, and four, three. So the regularity is one. Okay. If you didn't fully get what the regularity is, that's okay. You can just treat it as a black box. You can just treat it as every homogeneous ideal gets a number associated to it called the regularity, which is somehow measuring the complexity of the ring. Okay, so these are my two objects, my uh, H polynomial and its degree and its regularity. And so a couple of years ago, Hibi and Matsuda kind of raised this question. Is there a relationship? Is there, must there be a relationship between the degree and the regularity? Okay. Now, you may actually think, well, isn't that kind of a bizarre question? Because all I've done is I've taken two invariants to a ring and you know, why should there be any sort of relationship, right? Why, why would you want to compare these? Well, it turns out that there's an alternate form of the Hilbert series, okay? So you can actually figure out what the Hilbert series is in terms of all these graded Betty numbers that I had up on a previous slide. And so remember the regularity is somehow connected to these numbers right here. So this is the Hilbert series in the non-reduced form and the H polynomial comes from it when we put this uh, rational function in reduced, uh, reduced form. So both the regularity and the degree are encoded in the resolution, the same object. So it, you know, it, this kind of makes sense to see if there's any sort of relationship between the two. Okay, and there are some general relations that are known. Okay, it's always known that the difference between the regularity, the degree, and the regularity is bounded above by the difference between the crawl dimension of the ring and the depth of the ring. And the depth is just the longest regular sequence you can find in the ring. We know that this inequality becomes inequality if your resolution has what's an extreme Betty number. So I won't define what that is, but there are conditions on which we can force this to be an equality. And again, if you know this term, you know what it means for a ring to be called Macaulay, then actually we have equality between these two numbers. Okay, so the question is, what else can we say about this? We might say, well, if I look for a particular class of ideals, for example, maybe I, I can only have some sort of particular values of regularity and degree. Okay, um, so, as I said, Hibbe and Matsuda were the first ones to look at this, and they proved back in 2018 that, the, to me, this is a quite surprising result that, you know, in fact, for any integers D and R, there's actually a monomial ideal whose regularity is R and whose degree is D. Okay, so if you just restrict to the class of monomial ideals, so these are ideals generated by monomials, you can actually obtain every possible R and D. And they went a step further and they showed that the monomial ideal could be what's called a Lex segment ideal. I won't define it, but it, it's kind of a, a subclass of monomial ideals. Okay, and if you, if you dive into the proofs of their, their, their results, what's interesting is, let's say you wanted to make the case, uh, look at the case, uh, taking regularity much bigger than the D. Let's say R is 2000 and the degree is two. Then you need at least 4,000 variables in your polynomial ring to do it. And you need at least a generator of degree roughly on the order of 2000, okay? And, and same thing, you know, in the Lex segment case, even if you wanted the regularity 2000 and degree D, you still need a generator roughly on the order of 2000 in the regular, uh, and you need at least 2000 variables, okay? But you can do it, okay? So as I said, this is kind of, to me, it was a surprising result, you know, that like you could just obtain every possible DNR because there seemed to be no possible restriction. So I actually heard uh, Hibby first talk about this. I think it was in 2017, we were at a, a conference at Banff and uh, I was telling him over lunch, you know, oh, that was, you know, very surprising results, you know, that's a great idea. You know, what happens though, like if you put some restrictions on say the degrees of the generators, like for example, edge ideals, and I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, maybe you're forcing the regularity and degree to be something. And he, you know, he said to me, well, that's a great idea. We should do a paper. So that's how I got involved in this project and the advantages of going to lunch at conferences. Uh, and so the question that I asked Hibby over lunch was, okay, suppose you have an edge ideal Okay, and I'll, I, which is defined below, is there a relationship between the degree and the regularity? So what's the edge ideal of a graph? Okay, so I think everybody's comfortable with a graph, you know, it has edges E and um, vertices X1 through Xn, and it's a finite graph here. And we're gonna say, well, if there's an edge between Xi and Xj, 
we make the monomial xi times xj and we run through all possible edges. Okay, so here's my four, here's a four cycle. X1 is connected X2, so I get a generator X1, X2. X2 is connected X3, so I get a generator X2 times X3. Okay, so we're putting a much stronger uh, restriction on the family of ideals that we're looking at because all of our all of our ideals now have to be generated in degree two, and they have to be generated in uh, by square free monomials of degree two. So it's a pretty strong restriction. So, <coughs> excuse me, I thought that there, we thought that there should be some sort of uh, relationship between them. So what, should, what did we do first of all? Well, you know, I came back from BAMP and the first thing I did is like, well, let's go hit it with the computer, right? Let's see what it can do for us. So on the left, I over all graphs on eight vertices, I computed all the possible R's and D's that showed up. And I did the same thing for all graphs on nine vertices. Here's all the possible R's and D's. You know, there's over a quarter million examples computed. And you're probably staring at this and you're like, oh, there, there seems to be some sort of pattern going on. There seems to be some sort of lower bound given by this line. And there seems to be some sort of restriction going this way. And based upon this, you might make some sort of conjecture. Okay, and that's what we did. And so we made some computational evidence and we said, well, the degree of the H polynomial plus the regularity can be no more than the number of vertices. Um, so that means if you wanted to do a particular DNR, you have to definitely make sure you have enough vertices. And there also seems to be some restriction between the degree and the regularity, more namely the degree has to be bigger than or equal to the regularity of minus one. Okay, well, it turned out guess one is totally correct that uh, the sum of the degree plus the regularity is no more than that. On the other hand, guess two is really wrong. And of course, the moral here is hundreds of thousands of examples are still really not enough to come up with good conjecture sometimes. And how wrong were we? Well, it, it turns out that even if we restrict to edge ideals of graphs, there exists a graph uh, uh, for any pair of D and R, there exists a graph G whose regularity is R and its degree is D. So we put a huge restriction on the family of ideals we're looking at, but we still can obtain every possible R and D. Okay, so I thought this was quite a surprising result. Um, and just let me say a couple of things about the, uh, uh, the, the proof here. And, I, and the reason I wanna say something about the proof here is because it's the same sort of strategy that shows up in many papers here. So the idea of the proof is like, say that you, you have a graph G and you know its regularity R and it, you know its degree D is D. And you, let's say we plot it. So we know this, we know what we can obtain this particular R and D. We have a lemma that says that <coughs> from this graph, we can make a new graph G tilde whose regularity gets bumped up by one and its degree gets bumped up by one, right? So we can think about as we can now obtain this guy. But now we can take this graph and just feed it back into the lemma and we can get a graph with regularity is r plus two and degree is d plus two. So we can get everything along this ray. So as I mentioned, this is like a similar strategy used in other papers. You, you look at your family of ideals, say that you have an r and a d, then you manipulate that ideal to show that you can get uh, another ideal in your family whose regularity gets bumped up by one and its degree gets bumped up to one. So if you're interested now of showing that all possible R and D in the plane are possible, what you need is kind of seeds along the border. And once you get the border, you can just hit it with this lemma to show that you can get everything in the plane. Okay, and that's just kind of what the slide says here is just a reduction of the proof. Okay, so it turns out though, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> To get uh, regularity one and degree D, that was easy, but getting the regularity R, anything, and the degree one was the hard part. Why was the first part easy? Well, that was already in the literature. We just had to go look it up and KDD, the complete graph KDD uh, gave us the result that we needed, uh, regularity one and degree D. For the degree R, or, or sorry, for the regularity R and the degree one, we had to work a lot harder at getting it. And the rough idea was we would make a bow tie graph, this bow tie graph, we take a bunch of disjoint edges, and then we'd make the giant complete graph. Okay, so it's two to the power of R, 
So if you want a regularity, say 2000, you're looking at two to the 2000 uh, <coughs> graph on two, 2000 vertices. And then you have to join all those pieces together and then you get the desired regularity. Okay, and so just as an example, this was the graph that gave us regularity three and degree one. Okay, so the stage so far is that, okay, for edge ideals, even with edge ideals, you can get an all possible D and R. And so that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but now let's say that we go back to these graphs here. You, you're probably thinking about it when I threw this slide up, is that what happens if we fix the act? Okay, and this was actually a question uh, Dan Ehrman asked me back when I presented this talk, uh, earlier results um, in Ottawa a couple of years ago. And the point is, if you fix the N, it looks like there still is some sort of uh, limited R and D that you're allowed. So in the previous part, we're allowing the number of variables to go off to infinity. But if you fix the number of N, what kind of restriction can you have? Well, so, for fixed n, what pairs r and d can be realized, okay? And so we know that d plus r always has to be less than or equal to n, but what about what are the other values that you can, can be allowed? Okay, and so in order to study this, we uh, looked at the set rdn. So rdn consists of all pairs r and d, where there exists a connected graph on n vertices such that r uh, the pair R and D can be realized. Okay. Okay. And what we what we were able to found in a, a follow up paper and in the follow up pair, paper Kimura joined us is we were we defined two sets A N and B N. Okay, and there's it consists of a bunch of pairs R D. It's a little hard to see what these sets look like, but I'll do an example in a second. And we proved that you know for each integer n. The set AN is a subset of the set that we're looking at for, and RDN is a subset of the set BN. Okay, and so what we're doing is we're getting bounds on the possible R and D. And since this uh, conference is related to the ECA journal, I should point out that this is a result that appeared in uh, volume two of the, of the of the journal. Okay, so as an example, let's say that we're interested in describing all the possible R and D for uh, 11 vertices. Okay, so graphs on 11 vertices. The previous result says that all the black points are, are definitely realizable. We can find a graph that realizes one of the black points. On the other hand, the R and D may contain, the set of allowable R and D may also contain some of these circled points but we're not sure exactly which of the circled ones that we have. And in fact, for 11 vertices, I actually haven't even computed all the possible R and D, uh, something I hope to get to at some point. Okay, now in some ways, you know, that's kind of a nice answer, but it's, in some ways it's not very satisfactory, right? Because what we would want to be able to do is describe all the possible R D. So can we do better for special families of graphs? And it turns out that we can for what are called Cameron Walker graphs. Now, so I'll let me quickly describe what a Cameron Walker graph is. There, there's a lot of information on this slide, but all it's really doing is talking about a matching in a graph. So a matching in a graph is just a bunch of edges in your graph that are disjoint. They have no endpoints in common. So that's a matching. And the matching number is the maximal cardinality. That's the biggest matching you can make. An induced matching, it's also a matching, but you have an extra condition that for any two edges that are in your matching, there's no edge connecting those two edges in your graph. And so then you have what's called the induced matching number, and it's just the maximal cardinality of an induced matching number. And since an induced matching is a matching, the induced matching number is less than or equal to the matching. So both this graph on the left is called the star graph. The graph on the right is called the star triangle. And so this is, you want to think about a bunch of triangles all connected at a common vertex. And both of these graphs have the property that the induced matching number is equal to the matching, right? So in the star graph, just take a single edge and that's a matching and an induced matching. And so a Cameron Walker graph is any graph whose uh, induced matching number is equal to its matching number, 
but we exclude these two families of graphs. Okay, so any other graph whose induced matching number is equal to its matching number. Okay, so why, why would we want to pick this class of graphs to study? Well, there, there's a couple of good reasons. One good reason is Cameron and Walker uh, completely described the structure of these graphs uh, in 2005. So it's completely, uh, it's a graph theory paper. I think it appears in discrete math. Okay, it's nothing to do with uh, commutative algebra at all. However, it's been shown that for Cameron Walker graphs, they're particularly nice because the regularity is simply the common number between uh, the, the common shared number, the matching number and the induced matching number. So the regularity becomes a combinatorial invariant of, of the graph. And so it's a little bit easier to work with when you're doing some of these problems. And not only that, <coughs> excuse me, Hibi, Kimura, Matsuda, and Tuchia had already proved that the degree of the H polynomial is bigger than equal to the regularity for the Cameron Walker graph. So putting all of these pieces together, uh, working uh, Hibi, Kimura, Matsuda, and myself actually showed that for any n greater than or equal to five, there exists a Cameron Walker graph on n vertices with regularity r and degree d, if and only if the d and the r satisfy the series of inequalities. Okay, and like the previous result, uh, this, this result also appeared in the uh, volume two of the ECA. And here we all are. This was from my trip to Japan a couple of years ago. Uh, when we were all uh, working on this particular problem. Okay, so in the title, I talked about, you know, combinatorially defined ideals. There are other ways to associate to a graph uh, uh, an ideal. Okay, two big examples are what are called binomial edge ideals and torque ideals of graphs. Okay, I won't give the formal definition here, but I'll just say that you have a graph and you can get an ideal associated to it. We can look at the similar sorts of question, but in that context, we know a little bit less. Okay, Hibi and Matsudo were able to show that if you have a binomial edge ideal, <coughs> for any uh, degree bigger than or equal to the regularity of gradient two, you can actually cook up, uh, find a graph whose regularity is R and degree is D. And with uh, Fevecchio and, and Kuiper, I was able to show kind of a similar result for torque ideals of graphs, but you have to have this restriction that the R is greater than or equal to four. And then you can, and if D is bigger than or equal to R, then you can actually crook up the R, uh, a graph whose regularity is torque ideal, the regularity of its torque ideal is R and the degree of its H polynomial is D, okay? Uh, but unlike the case of the edge ideals, we don't really know what kind of a lot about what's happening when D is less than or equal to R, whether that's obtainable or not. Okay, so there's obviously a bunch of future directions uh, to go into this program, okay. Uh, obviously, one thing that would be nice is improving bounds on RDX, which is given explicit description of all the allowable R and D for uh, edge ideals. Also, I really want to explore what happens if the degree, can, can the degree of the H polynomial be the less than the regularity? I know of a handful of examples for toric ideals and binomial edge ideals. And I actually have a graduate student kind of thinking about this particular problem. And of course, we can explore similar questions for other families of ideals. Maybe you have your own particularly combinatorially defined ideal, and you might want to try looking at these two uh, invariants for that particular family. So lots of good questions. I'm sure you have your own. Uh, and so I think I'll just stop here. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Adam, for a lovely talk. Um, um, I, was, I was going to ask if anyone has any questions, but if I can ask a short one to begin with, uh, just out of curiosity, okay. how, how did Cameron Walker graphs enter the picture first? Was it, uh, the slide went by quite quickly, so I wasn't too sure if it's their defining oh. property or... I, I think like in the original paper of Cameron and Walker, they were just interested, they knew about the induced matching number and the matching number, and they were just like, well, can we classify when the, the, what graphs have that property? Can we give a complete description of that? So it's a completely just graph theory paper. And I think it was just, you know, when do these, what graphs have that property? Right, right, very interesting. Um, are there any other people with questions? <clears throat> Nice talk. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. 
Um, so I was wondering, has anybody tried to ask these kinds of questions for weighted graphs? Where by this I mean, suppose you have your vertices xi and xj, and you have a weight on the edge, say, k, and you associate it with the monomial xi to the k, xj to the k. Uh, yeah, so there's been some work uh, done on that. It's more somehow, um, sometimes you just give a weight to the end, like to endpoints. So you go xi to oh, xj okay. to the k, it, right. because you want to, because everything's commutative, you want to kind of, it, it's sometimes a little tricky to keep. That's, that's exactly. more for a directed graph, but uh, right. the question about have they looked at weighted graphs uh, and then the degree and the regularity, that part hasn't been done, but there has been people that have been looked at variations of weighted graphs common, uh, algebraically. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay. Rob. Any further questions for Adam? Okay, well, otherwise, thank you very much again, Adam. Okay, thank you. Thanks.